Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, it's not. Well, hello and welcome to uh, this virtual edition of the Profiles and Perspectives Community Enrichment Series put on by the Noble Foundation. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started today. I wanted to, to mention to you guys that uh, if you want to find out about future Profiles and, event, profiles and Perspectives events that we're going to put on, you can check uh, the description. We, we've pro provided a link there. Um, just so you know, Profiles and Perspectives is a series in which we've had people ranging from paleontologists to zoologists to astronauts to National Geographic photographers come and talk, give lectures uh, free of charge. So hop on there, sign up for future events uh, to stay in the know. Also, I wanted to mention that today's presentation, which is all about regenerative ranching and regenerative agriculture, if, if this topic interests you and you want to stay in the know about that, you'll also find a link in the description to subscribe to our uh, weekly email newsletter from Noble Research Institute that's called Noble Rancher. And there you can get weekly information about uh, actionable tips and, and, uh, and useful industry information about regenerative agriculture. So check that out as well. Um, on to today's speaker. Today we are proud to have Meredith Ellis with us. Uh, Meredith is of the G Bar C Ranch, um, and she has been a champion of soil health and regenerative ranching for a number of years. Um, she's spoken all over the country on this topic. I've had the privilege of actually being out to her ranch in Roston, Texas, um, and just it's one of those places that truly feels like a, a Garden of Eden kind of place with uh, beautiful rolling streams, tree lined. Um, all these fields with with healthy cows and just this diverse mix of of uh, of wildlife and plants. It's it's truly a gorgeous spot. She's going to kind of talk to us about how she has been able to regenerate her own land um, and how she's worked with Mother Nature to both restore this land and also you know basically have a result that produces healthier land, cleaner water, and more nutritious food. Um, so Meredith is one who cares about the product that she's producing, but honestly, she cares deeply about the land itself. Uh, and so we are so excited to have her here today talking to us. And I will now turn it over to Meredith Ellis. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. 
introduction and um, thank you to Noble for having me and, and thank, thank you all, all at home for, for tuning in. in. Um, um, I wanted to start with a virtual tour of our ranch just, just, just to give you an idea of what it, what it looks like and what we're dealing with on our land. Um, so first of all, we have uh, 3,000 acres located in north central Texas. Um, it's uh, characterized as at the convergence of two ecoregions, so that's the Cross Timbers ecoregion and the Great Plains ecoregion. So we have a lot of bottom land that looks like this, that's got um, uh, lush Bermuda grass with little clumps of trees here and there. Um, we've also got um, about a thousand acres of upland native prairie grasses. Um, in these areas, I've documented just countless species. It's just got wonderful biodiversity to it. Um, and then we've, we've also got a number of water resources. We've got little creeks and streams in watersheds, seasonal watersheds running through our ranch. Um, we've also got ponds and a lake on our land. And then we've got 6% of our land is technically cropland. It's um, no-till cropland. Um, these are the cattle that are grazing winter wheat, but in the summer we plant a um, diverse mix um, for abiding by the principles of soil health that our cattle also graze. Uh, we have about a thousand acres of forest land as well, which our cattle um, call home. These are my Totoro cows, cows, that's what I call them. And I love the forest. This is the biggest tree on our ranch, and here's me hugging the ancient forest. It's, uh, it's really special. Um, but it's very diverse, and Managing that diversity so it just thrives and functions as it was meant to function is a big reason why I am a rancher. Uh, so far, I've cataloged 420 different species on iNaturalist. Um, and so that's, you know, that's important. And, uh, but what I, where I want to take you now is I want to take you back to the beginning and let you know how uh, I decided that I wanted to be a rancher, so how I became a rancher. And to start at the beginning, we have to start with my dad. Um, both my parents have always been lovers of the outdoors. They met at the University of Denver and loved hiking and camping. My dad discovered his love of ranching after working for his dad on his ranch called the Bell Branch Ranch in Italy, Texas. So that's that quintessential longhorn and blue bonnet shot in at the picture that you're looking at. Um, my grandfather sold that ranch and my dad set out to continue his newfound interest in search of the perfect ranch. So he wore out two pickup tru trucks driving all over the state looking for a really good spot and he and my mom finally settled purchasing the initial 350 acres about 40 years ago. So that's me on the blanket right there. But since then, in that 40 year time span, the ranch has grown to about 3,000 acres. Um, I feel like my dad specifically wanted something that could both provide habitat for native species and sustain a cattle operation. Um, I think one of his greatest joys is seeing the wildlife, which we have plenty of. But I would describe my youth as completely immersed in nature. So I knew how to make fires, ride horses, and forage at a very early age. I knew the names of plants and wild wildflowers, which ones would sting you, which ones were good to eat, which ones my horse liked to eat. Um, I knew where the deer bedded down uh, when the monarchs arrived, what cloud formations indicated weather change. I knew the Milky Way, Orion's Belt, and the Big and Little Dipper. So I was like Mowgli, basically. Uh, I was raised by coyotes, <laughs> but seriously, that was literally my childhood. And at that time, I just took it all for granted. You know, that's all I knew, and I simply took it for granted. Um, so after high school, I traveled. I went to Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, and more. Um, I ended up going to the University of New Mexico 
getting my master's degree in landscape architecture with a focus on sustainability. And it was there that I started to see things in a whole different light. I started to see how fractured our natural landscape was and how we as humans have severely altered many natural processes that are critical for our own survival. So Albuquerque, this is the Rio Grande Valley. Um, Albuquerque was unique because there's very little water and what little water does fall, it needs to be used as effectively as possible. So you get the Rio Grande Valley running through this vast network of acequias, ancient acequias or water ditches that are going to cropland and then on top of that you have city infrastructure, schools and universities, hospitals, an air force base, a population of almost 600,000 people. But if you really think about it, it all ties back to that little ribbon of water. That was the beginning of it all. The life force of that whole thing. And that is just utterly humbling. And, and if we think about how many of us nowadays live in areas completely divorced from the natural landscape or where their food comes from. So the tap magically creates water, the switch magically creates light, we go to a big box store and every food is there no matter the season. It, it becomes a society completely divorced from the living world. So the question is where is the living world these days? Um, I love this quote from philosopher Jack Turner, what counts as wilderness is not determined by the absence of people, but the relationship between people and place. And I would argue that we have largely lost our relationship with that wilderness. You know, and our disconnect from that living web exists within agriculture as well. So this cropland artificially irrigated by pumping groundwater out of the Ogallala Aquifer in what I would call a finite operation. You know, it's reliant on basically manufactured rainfall and nutrients. So there's very little that's natural about this food production method. And I will argue that for the further away that you go from what, quote, nature wants to do, the more impact you're going to feel with the climate and variability. Um, so the less resilient and efficient you'll be, you'll become in the coming years. And this situation right here has a finite timeline. When the groundwater runs out, this will no longer be viable. And the consequences of that, the lack of foresight, will eventually be realized. So cropland relying on groundwater pumping from the Ogallala Aquifer represents one-fifth of all wheat corn, cotton, and cattle in the United States. And so if we look at this aquifer depletion, we can see how little time we have. Um, according to the Civil Eats reporting, complete replenishment of the aquifer would take some 6,000 years. So once it's gone, as far as our timeline is concerned, it's gone. So can you imagine one-fifth of our food production you know, so this is what I'm talking about in regards to our disconnect with nature. The more removed from nature our food production system is, the more trouble we're going to find ourselves in, and the less resilient our food supply chain is going to be. And with climate change on top of that, we can begin to see the consequences of our decisions on the land. So here is the Hoover Dam, and I'm just going to try to toggle back and forth to show you the changes between 1984 and 2000. So you can kind of see how we're slowly or, you know, maybe quickly hacking away at that, that finite resource as well. Um, but in this day and a land is going to it, its highest and best use in the form of how we as humans perceive that to be. And right now our national landscape is grossly valued on the dollar figure. So how much money can I get out of it? What can I do to this land to gain the most money? You know, this turns up with frightening regularity in the form of real estate 
and land conversion. So this is an image of the landscape that I grew up in. Um, it's just pastoral views of the prairie and farmland dotted with trees. And this is that exact same image today, just being completely paved over. And when we talk about our national grazing lands, we really have hi historically undervalued it, not realizing its importance. It plays on species conservation, the hydrological cycle, and water quality downstream, and carbon sequestration. So Texas is separated into all these different ecoregions, but I wanted to highlight one in particular, and that's, that's the ecoregion that's in the purple. So that purple strip on the map is called the Blackland Prairie. And what was once 12 million acres of pristine habitat has now dwindled into about 5,000 acres remain remaining. So here's an island of it remaining in Frisco. It's surrounded on all sides by development. In the United States and Canada, about 80% of our grasslands have been converted to other uses. Around 97% of the tall grass prairie has been converted. Globally, every year we lose a grassland land mass equivalent to the country of Kuwait to cropland and development. That's around 4,200,000 acres a year globally. And that gets to one of the initial problems of how our grasslands are valued. This quote, velvet black soil was perfect for converting to cropland. You know, there's value in that fertile soil tilled for crops and then subsequently sold off as real estate to developers once we got all the good out of it. But do you know why that soil is black? That's sequestered atmospheric CO2. And when you disturb that, whether by overgrazing, tilling for cropland, or excavating for development, you release that CO2 back into the atmosphere. You know, in this day and age, we need to understand our prairie ecosystems not as valuable in terms of real estate, but intrinsically valuable in its ecosystem services that it provides our planet. So it's almost as if we need to flip our thinking, not so much what can I get out of this land, it's what is the value that this natural landscape currently provides our planet in its pristine condition. And when we look at these changes over time on the national level, this is a light pollution map. We can see that there's really very little places that remain untouched by our human hand. When we live disconnected with nature, we break those ecological cycles that are critical to our survival. The water cycle, the nutrient cycle, that living soil web, and on so many levels in this photo, the solar cycle and species migration disruption, etc. So how did we get here? Um, you know, as much as my college education was on soil health, broad land use patterns, water management, etc., it was also on theory, um, the psychology of man versus wild. So um, from the point of view of Lewis and Clark, so I don't know if you can see, but there, there's a guy in a red jacket and a, and a guy standing next to him in that picture. That's Lewis and Clark. So from the point of view of Lewis and Clark, who do you think had the upper hand? Was it man or nature? Well, it's clearly nature because, I mean, they could simply just twist an ankle out there and just die. Um, so nature had the big time upper hand and man was just at the whim of nature. And so in man's psychological view, nature was there to be conquered and to be dominated and controlled because our very own survival was at stake. And so what did we do? Well, we killed the bison and the Indians. We fenced off the whole thing. We used the plow and machinery to cut down trees, to till the prairie, to plant crops. We dammed up rivers to create reservoirs for our cities, to build that infrastructure so that we could thrive. But now what has happened? You know, how many species do you see in this picture? So all of a sudden now we have way, way the upper hand and nature is at the whim of us. How many functioning ecological processes are in this picture? You know, how many species do we see? 
How about natural habitat? Again, we have the upper hand and nature is at our, our whim. So now uh, I leave college and I get back home to our ranch and you can see what I saw. You know, here's my dad working within a thriving functioning ecosystem, pr preserving those ecological processes and feeding the world. You know, that's incredibly important to continue that and build upon that. You know, could you imagine if I decided to sell this land and subdivide it? You know, how many species would I just wipe clean off the map? Five miles down the road from this picture, there's a 90 home subdivision going in. So this isn't just, you know, abstract thinking. Um, so that's my motivation and my job as a rancher is to take care of this, you know, to work within nature and not against it and to make this land more resilient because of cows, not in spite of cows. And now I'm going to show you how we do that on our ranch. So it's not just the historic bison on our Great Plains. Species of all sorts are an integral part of grasslands all over our planet, as this image of wildebeests and zebras in Africa. You know, they exist in symbiosis within their region. That's how they have evolved over a millennia. So, so um, I, you know, what could all of these animals be doing in this picture? in this landscape? Well, they're migrating, so they're constantly moving. They're eating grass, they're drinking water, they're trampling dead plant matter into the soil, creating essentially compost, building that carbon layer. They're knocking seed heads onto the ground and then fertilizing them with their manure and urine, and then they're gone. And this process of the right disturbance over time leads to a healthy, dynamic, diverse community for a host of living species and microorganisms. So this picture literally is my job as a rancher. Our cows eat the grass, they do that right disturbance, and then they're gone off to a different part of the ranch. And so we've divided our 3,000 acres into 58-ish different permanently fenced pastures and are newly using temporary fencing to further sub subdivide that to basically help um, us migrate appropriately to optimize that disturbance recovery threshold for the most vitality of all species. It is a science, but it's also an art, relying on years of observation and paying attention to those interactions between the cattle and their landscape. That's what ranchers do. That's, what, that's why ranching is so important. And so keep the cows moving. So here we are moving the cows. Here they are again, just constantly moving. Okay, look at this slide right here and tell me how much it looks like the next slide. So that's us, now look at this. See, we are mimicking a natural process using ruminant anim animals to benefit the land and themselves in the setting in which they co-evolved. So let's talk about the prairie that these animals call home and just how powerful and resilient it is. So this is a section into the earth of a thriving, diverse native pasture. And you can see all the different species of plants and their root structures. And many of these grassland roots go yards into the earth. But to add to that is an underground communication between these plants and their nutrients exchange. The reason these plants are so successful at being drought and flood resilient isn't because of these incredible roots. It's that soil biology, and that's what you're seeing in the red, the living soil web. And so if we add this mycorrhizal fungi to the tips of all these existing plant roots, their ability to reach and exchange nutrients in some cases is expanded up to 700% compared to just roots alone. And so if the plant on the left 
um, has potassium and is needing nitrogen, it, communi it can communicate along those mycorrhizal fungi pathways and talk to its neighbors. It can say, hey, do you have nitrogen? And the plant on the right can say, hey, yeah, I'm actually a nitrogen fixating legume. Here you go. Um, and, and that exchange is incredibly powerful. And in times of drought, you know, look how deep that soil web goes into the earth. You know, they're, they're still getting plenty of moisture. In times of flood, every drop of rain is soaked into that spongy ground. This is climate resilience, and it's all because of that underground Wi-Fi. And when you look at healthy prairie soil visually, you can see the accumulation of that fungus, bacteria, protozoa, earthworm slime, glomalin, and carbon all acting as a binding agent holding all those nutrients in place. So when we get a four inch rain in an hour, all of that water percolates deep into the soil, emerging from the hillside as a spring. And this is what our prairie looks like. A 3,000 acre Brita filter. That water is crystal clear and drinkable. It's an ephemeral spring just coming right out of the hillside. Now let's talk about agricultural practices removed from that living soil web, either by overgrazing or tilling the soil. That underground community is completely broken. So if you see that healthy soil web in the red and, and, and black roots and compare that to just roots alone in a broken soil web instance, um, you know, within a functioning nutrient cycle, that this healthy root system, it's able to soak up water and, and to hold on to water and access water for extended periods of time. It's able to access and ex exchange nutrients as well. But if we look at the consequences of that broken soil web, in real life, this is what it looks like. You know, we can see the devastation to our landscape. This tilled cropland could not hang on to the water. Instead, the water is rushing off, carrying all that powdered soil and any remaining nutrients downstream for the municipalities to have to filter out. So my job and really where my eye goes is not to the cows and not to the plants, but what's happening in the soil. So I am a soil steward. And I've always got to have a picture of cow poop. You know, the microbiome is so important. Cows are walking microbiomes. They are compost factories and soil builders. You know, this is just utterly incredible, incredible to me. I've got dozens of pictures of poop on my phone because it's, it's just so beautiful. You know, we as humans have to nurture our microbiome. And if we view our soils in the same light as our gut, we can realize this hidden health or lack of health within our planet's soils. So, you know, look at all that species diversity in the image to your right. You know, it's just that tiny little ground view right there. But this is why I call it the Great Barrier Reef. It is so powerful and so important. When we live disconnected from our food source and disconnected with how we have evolved within that natural system, we forget about this. We forget about these things, and they're so valuable. You know, so for the longest time, you know, I, I couldn't put a value on this endangered orchid growing on our land. You know, what does that mean to me? You know, our cows can't eat it. I suppose pollinators like it. It's super rare, but it really doesn't serve an obvious function in my return on my investment. But if you really think about it, the exact opposite is true. Species like these are the exact indicators that tell me that I am doing a good job. Their very presence on my land tells me that my below ground community is thriving. So you ask me what my end of year bonus is, it's seeing this. This land is telling me thank you whenever that blooms. And this meadow with Tope Topeka coneflower is also critically imperiled. This is why I ranch, and I've got hundreds of examples like these. 
um, this forest providing a whole different habitat for a whole wider array of species such as owls, bald eagles, woodpeckers, cliff break fern also on the imperiled list. And the forest is wonderful for cattle. The tips of greenbrier provide 30% protein for them. In the fall, they often stay in the woods eating nuts that fall from the trees. When it's 100 degrees in the heat of the summer, this is their cool spot. When it's freezing in winter, this is their shelter. These areas go hand in hand with ranching, which in turn go hand in hand with species conservation. So the National Park Service estimates for U.S. grassland that there are between 40 and, 40 and 60 different species of grasses alone. The other 20% of the primary vegetation is made up of over 300 species of forbs or flowers. The prairie has over 100 species of lichens and liverworts, as well as numerous species of woody trees and shrubs along creeks and protected areas. So what at first glance appears to just be grass is in truth an empire teeming with biodiversity. It is the Great Barrier Reef of North America and it deserves more respect and attention. So now let's talk about methane and global warming. And the, the fact that we have 10 years to cut our global emissions in half or we are basically all going to be in big trouble. Um, these are quotes from, from the IPCC report about six weeks ago. Um, I'll just read them to you. The future, uh, the IPCC states that the future is going to get much worse faster in terms of heat waves, wildfires, droughts, superstorms with torrential rains and floods. At best, the world will, now this is best case scenario. At best, the world will be a harsh, globally disastrous planet to inhabit with multiple frequent, even compound, hard-hitting extreme events, and this will be the nature of the new climate. The report provides new estimates of the chances of crossing the global warming level of 1.5 degrees Celsius in the next decades and finds that unless there are immediate, rapid, and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to close to 1.5 degrees or even 2 degrees will be beyond reach. So now is our time. The world's governments and policymakers are meeting for the UN Climate Summit in November to discuss how they are going to solve this global catastrophe. You know, I have a seven-year-old, and this is the reason why I have trouble falling asleep at night. You know, so what is beef's role in this? My contention is that in the coming decade, every food and fiber producer will have to be at the top of their game in terms of climate resilience to survive, meaning no less than being direct climate solutions, not sources. And let me show you. So for the past three years, our ranch has been piloting the Ecosystem Services Market Consortium, which is a nonprofit seeking to quantify our carbon footprint as well as water quality and biodiversity and to commoditize those ecosystem services to others down the beef supply chain. If you measure methane emitted from cattle, you must also measure the land held in trust that actually raises that beef. Remember, land goes to its highest and best use. It's measuring how those cattle are raised upon the landscape. So the emissions quantification was done through a grant through the Foundation for Food and Ag Research and required enormous amounts of data. So they first measured how much our emissions were. So not just the cow burps, but also the gasoline we used, the fertilizer we put out, the grazing impact on our plant life, et cetera. But then it also measured the amount of CO2 that that plant life was sequestering in the soil th throughout that identical time period. And when you add it all up, the modeling indicates that we are a big time carbon sink, sequestering a net 2,500 tons of CO2 every single year. So that's like taking 551 cars off the road every year. So my land is home to countless species. My water cycle is fully functional and climate resilient. 
I provide the planet with 69 million nutrient dense calories every year and take 2,500 tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere at the same time. So do you see the potential here? Through the ecosystems market, instead of financially incentivizing a rancher to focus solely on pounds of beef, so that's all a rancher gets paid for, we are incentivizing also tons of CO2 sequestered, gallons of water purified downstream, and acres of habitat conserved. To turn a rancher's eye towards those things that benefit us all could be a game changer in the industry. Land goes to its highest and best use. Think of the potential if habitat, water, and carbon was its highest and best use. So here are some statistics about the prairie. 62% of U.S. rangelands is held privately, which is around 409 million acres, according to the NRCS. U.S. grazing lands, including managed pasture lands, have the potential to remove an additional 198 million tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere per year for 30 years. And it cannot be done without cattle. So this is big blue stem, it's a major carbon vacuum, but it relies on cattle disturbance or it will begin to kill itself. If it hasn't been grazed or burned in a while, that dead leaf matter remains oxidized above the soil, acting as essentially a cover, limiting new growth from occurring. Um, with cattle, that oxidized dead matter becomes trampled into the ground, contacting the ground, and then it's fertilized, which begins that composting process and soil building process. So look at the difference when that grassland is introduced to proper grazing. Look at that rebound. Here's another example. So on the left is soil type 40. Well, on both sides, it's soil type 47, which is characterized as um, just known to be an incredibly thin topsoil layer, and then it's just limestone below that. Um, but the pasture on the left has not been grazed in 40 years, and the pasture on the right has been regeneratively grazed. So look at that blue stem in the picture on the right. You know, that, that's a lot of biomass. And so why did that occur? Um, the soil on the right has been built upon by cattle pushing those seeds and dead leaf matter into the ground and fertilizing it with their manure, which again is basically adding a mulch or compost layer. And over time, that layer turns to soil. We have essentially added inch upon inch of organic soil to this landscape. That is the power that ruminant animals have when allowed to exist appropriately within the landscape that they co-evolved. And to show you the difference between my constantly migrating cows and those that are removed from that cy cycle, this is a fence line photo of a, regenerati a regeneratively managed beef operation on the right versus a beef operation not allowing cattle to properly function within the ecosystem. So is that, is that property on the left building upon the soil layer and sequestering carbon? Absolutely not. In fact, it's well on its way to decimating that soil web. So you can see the difference in that biomass and biodiversity. It's not the cow, it's the how. Here's another side. Um, so the operation on the, on the left has had their cattle parked in that same pasture for five months, and look what has just happened to that soil. It's baking in the sun, killing all of that soil biology. During the next rain, all of that topsoil will just wash away. During a drought, these roots on, on the right-hand side will be deep in the ground still, holding on to that moisture. And the cows on the right will still have grass to eat, all because regenerative grazing is mimicking nature and keeping those cattle moving from pasture to pasture. And in terms of, copper, in, in, in terms of carbon, the operation on the left is a carbon source, and the, uh, is a carbon source. And the operation on the right is a carbon sink. So it's not the cow, it's the how. And ecosystem service markets 
paying ranchers for the how part of it could really create an enormous beneficial impact to our planet, incentivizing people like the, like the property on the left to improve. So let's see um, what's happening below ground on these two differing management styles. Um, so the soil on the left is really just sand at this point. You know, that, that, that soil web has, has collapsed. It's, it's lighter, it's more powdery. It both compacts easier and washes away easier. Regeneratively managed landscapes are much darker you know, that's atmospheric CO2, you guys, locked within this dirt. The, this soil is a sponge for water, and it's what, it's what everything is, is all about, is making your soil like that. So here's a little kitchen science experiment. Um, I put the same tilled and overgrazed soil in the glass on the left, and then healthy rangeland soil in a glass on the right, and poured water in both. And look at the difference. The healthy soil immediately absorbed all of the water. And then look what happened to the soil on the left, representing most of our national agricultural lands. It's not percolating at all. Um, you know, without that living soil web, that soil has just collapsed. In fact, in a rain, most of that rainfall will wash away downstream, as well as the top soil, soil layer and any artificial fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides. Um, this is the importance of that soil biology, that underground network. And here's a live action photo of what's happening with that soil that was in the glass on the left. This is a real life consequence of not paying attention to that soil biology in the natural nutrient cycle. So look how brown that water is. That is an enormous sediment load headed towards our next municipality's drinking water. Um, you know, and this is the dust bowl waiting to happen all over again. And in order to get anything to grow on this land, once the land dries out, it's going to take a lot of artificial inputs because that subsoil nutrient cycle is not functioning. Um, the underground nutrient exchange Wi-Fi is basically off. So if you take anything away from this whole talk, please remember that soil biology is the root of everything. Um, but here's our ranch water as it emerges from the prairie hillside after it rain. Here's our water once it flows into the creek headed to Dallas. The degradation of our soils is a lesson we should have already learned back in the 30s with the Dust Bowl, and we are still doing this. But now we are at the scope and scale that what could happen today could lead to food scarcity far beyond our comprehension. You know, again, food and fiber of all kinds managed regeneratively is home to a host of living things that desperately need our help. But you see, as you, as you, as you look at the top and then you go down to the bottom I image, the further away that we get from that soil web and the closer that we get to these sprawling monocultures, we see less and less room for the natural world to inhabit and coexist with us. So this is a soybean field um, completely removed from its surroundings. Where do the bald eagles make their nest? Where do monarch butterflies stop to re refuel? Um, where does that orchid grow in this picture? Monocultures do not occur in a natural system for a reason, and in our time of increased climate events, how resilient will landscapes like this be? This is an isolated food production method, and it's finite and it's fragile. So let's see how we can integrate it. So let's juxtapose that monoculture with cropland abiding by soil health principles to replenish and support that nutrient cycle and that water cycle, making room for species diversity. And you begin to build back that resilience. So that's water holding capacity in action, less reliance on artificial irrigation. That's cattle, that's cattle or your mo mobile fertilizer units 
um, that means less artificial fertilizer. That's a healthy microbiome in soil biology, and that's carbon being sequestered. This is integration, and this is resilience. You give back to the earth, and the earth gives to you. So I hope you are seeing how all of these things are tied together and that what is good habitat in species conservation is also good forage for the cattle, which is also good for water, which is also good for climate resilience and sequestering carbon. It's all tied together and it's because we are working within that natural landscape rather than mining it and transforming it into what we think it should be. There are a lot of farmers and ranchers out there that are like me and really paying attention to the system as a whole, but there needs to be more and vastly more awareness about the potential for those ranchers in the beef industry to really play a role in species conservation and turning our operations from carbon sources to sinks, locking it in the earth forever. So, um, what you can do if you're a consumer. Um, my first piece of wisdom would be to buy food and fiber directly from the source. Um, support regenerative, resilient observation, uh, operations. Um, and get to know where your food comes from. Get to know your local farmers. Have a more intimate connection with how your food is being produced. My third piece of advice is to turn whatever landscape you can into habitat and to support conservation organizations as well. Um, what you can do if you're a rancher. So abide by the principles of soil health within the context of your given operation. Don't get caught up in what other ranchers are doing. It's not a race, it's an ongoing process. Focus on rebound, leave grass to make grass, and don't return to your pastures too early. Integrate production systems. If you have a pasture that you're not grazing, um, that's cropland, start grazing it. Um, and uh, subscribe to, to Noble's um, publications. They, they're filled with a wealth of information and they can, those publications can help a lot as well. But the, my main takeaway for ranchers starting to um, want to adopt a regenerative practices is that um, I want ranchers to feel empowered that um, no one can tell you how to ranch better than, than you are doing. And if you regard the five principles of soil health <laughs> within your context as the guideline, um, then, then go forth and, and use those principles as, as you see fit. Um, so what, what you can do if you are a researcher uh, listen to ranchers and, and what they need. Ranchers are the decision makers and they should be the ones that are um, the driving, driving force but behind research. Uh, and then translate complicated results into action items. Uh, test everything on an actual working ranch. Test ranches should be better, should, should better show the process or the mistakes of getting from point A to point B. So it's not very helpful for um, a rancher to see the end result. It's vastly more helpful for a rancher to see the steps and the mistakes along the way that, that got you to that end result, basically. Um, but if we all just start to Start by acknowledging the precious, unique role that cattle play in improving our landscapes, um, in improving our water cycle, soil health, and habitat conservation, cropland resiliency, and work together in our own unique roles to be climate solutions, not sources. There will be nothing more impactful in our climate goals than the role of beef in the future. 
we have an immediate and pressing choice to either value this land as a finite resource accrual in the form of development or soil web destruction or look at the big picture, give nature some credit and value her for what she needs from us right now. Our heavy hand has shown its mark on the landscape and it is time now to let our native landscape take a lead role or we will not get out of this. Our cumulative legacy as beef producers will be decided in the next 10 years. And let's be part of the solution. Um, if you like what you've heard today and you are a uh, regenerative rancher, I encourage you to reach out to me or one of the board members of the Integrity Beef Alliance. Um, we're grouping all of our regenerative ranches together as the first producer developed sustainability program recognized by the US RSB in the nation. And so if that's something uh, you're interested in, uh, please contact me. And uh, I just appreciate all of your time and I look forward to your questions and continued collaboration. All right, well, thank you so much, Meredith. That was really fantastic. Um, we are now gonna turn on the chat. So um, if you have questions for Meredith, please go ahead and, and drop those in the chat now and uh, we will we'll get to as, as many as we can in, in the time we have allotted here. Um, until those questions start rolling in, I just I want to ask Meredith uh, a couple of things. When you started implementing some of these practices, how did you first notice that, that it was actually working? C can you remember back at, to, to when you actually saw some of this stuff changing your landscapes? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I would say we have a pretty good system of how we go about implementing change. So the first time, for example, that we decided to try cover crops, we have several different little pastures and we decided to just try it on one pasture and see how it went for us, um, baby steps. I highly recommend baby steps. Um, but it was so successful because our cattle had so many more acres to graze during the warm season that usually it was just a dormant fallow field. We had just extra grazing. We decided to uh, go ahead and plant all of our crop, all of our cropland that way. Um, and so that's, uh, success after success we've just built upon that um, we've begun because of that we've begun overseeding our bermuda fields for winter grazing focusing more on stockpiling our bermuda um, for our cattle to graze upon and also experimenting with uh, regenerating a native grass pasture in some new property that we bought by um, stimulating that soil biology by planting some nitrogen fixating legumes and that's namely clover and um, peas in there so I, 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 and the the point is 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 just a little baby step you know can can lead to a snowball effect of, of success basically can, can you also talk about whether a rancher can can both be a good steward of the land and also be profitable at the same time? Can you speak to that? Yeah, so um, I think, you know, my biggest concern for the future is climate resilience. And so I feel that our number one goal moving forward needs to be taking care of that soil web so um, we can have better water holding capacity and be more drought and flood tolerant moving forward. So um, uh, I think with increased climate events in the future, um, um, those, more, those landscapes that are more resilient, more regenerative are gonna be the ones that aren't victims to profit losses due to drought um, and flood, et cetera. Very good. I, I also wanted to mention for those of you who, who do have a question, uh, I apologize that those have not come through yet, but you can, uh, I'm told, refresh 
your, uh, your browser window. And hopefully, once you do refresh, you will see the uh, chat option become available for you. So go ahead and try that. And in the meantime, um, I also wanted to ask Meredith, um, what do you say to ranchers who, who think that maybe some of these associated practices, the, the practices associated with re regenerative agriculture, are just too difficult? Is there anything you would say to ranchers who, who are skeptical that this just might be too difficult for them? Yeah. It, so it's not, that's like the main thing that I would really like to communicate is that it's all up to you and, and, and what's going on at your operation. So take those principles of soil health and, and work with those in whatever manner you best see fit with whatever budget you best see fit. So that might mean um, just moving cattle more often. That might mean spending $250 on a hot wire fence to cross fence your land. That might mean trying uh, no-till instead of tilling your cropland. Um, you know, we're all at different levels. And so um, I, I guess the big takeaway is that um, I don't want you to come away with a prescription. I, I want ranchers to come away with some principles and always have those principles in your back pocket and little things, whatever you do, unrolling a bale of hay instead of um, putting it in a fixed ring. You know, um, start small and, and start to begin to see like maybe I should, um, I'm leaving too much bare ground. I should, I should uh, move my cattle more frequently, or I should unroll a bale instead of um, leaving a fixed ring. You'll, you'll start to, once you see those soil health principles, you'll, you'll start to realize um, some, some little steps that you can make to incorporate, uh, to, to make little changes that have big time results in your operation. All right, we are getting some, uh, some questions coming in. Um, Brittany Bowman asks, uh, she says, I'm interested in quantifying carbon sequestration in the cattle industry. Could you tell more about how you estimated the impact of your farm? Did I hear you right with 2,500 pounds per year for your place? Yeah, so that's 2,500 uh, net tons of CO2 sequestered every year. And I'm not the rancher. I mean, <laughs> I'm not the scientist. I'm the rancher and I'm the data giver. Um, I would uh, encourage you to uh, look up the Ecosystem Services Market Consortium on the internet and uh, um, delve into that because that, that's where um, those researchers and scientists lived that quantified my, my carbon footprint. Very good. And we also have uh, Ethan McJames um, asking, what are you over sowing your Bermuda pastures with? Yeah, so this, uh, this last year we overseeded our Bermuda with winter wheat solely, and we found that um, the cattle got a lot more nutrition out of it than just stockpiled Bermuda alone. It was incredibly successful. Uh, we were concerned about not uh, about growing wheat that was taking nutrients without giving nutrients back. So this year, we're overseeding our Bermuda pastures with winter wheat, but also adding some nitrogen fixating legumes in there as well. Excellent. Well, that takes us to uh, the end of our hour. So thank you so much to Meredith. And again, for those of you who are interested in learning more about uh, regenerative ranching and regenerative agriculture, go to the link in our description there where you'll find a, uh, our email newsletter, Noble Rancher, where you can sign up to, to get weekly emails about uh, regenerative ag. So thank you so much to Meredith, and uh, we'll see you guys next time.